Uh, hi. Uh, uh, th thank you for the introduction. Uh, so my name is uh, Ken Shaw. I'm uh, formerly the CTO of Multiply.com, and I'm currently the CTO of Broncos, uh, which is a uh, services and software provider for uh, banks and large financial institutions. So I'm kind of coming from to this conference in a kind of a different way than the other speakers and that I'm coming in a more kind of a technical capacity. Um, so I previously ran a very, very large MySQL cluster uh, as well as uh, I ran one of the largest websites in the world, you know, doing something around 8,000 requests per second. Uh, my kind of a point on this is that I actually come from a position of, of knowledge and experience on actually delivering large uh, APIs and systems at scale. And I'm an active open source developer and uh, contributor, and I'm fairly active in the uh, Southeast Asian technology community in general. I speak at conferences and meetups on a fairly regular basis. Uh, so that's just a, a quick background. Um, but basically, I just want to get into and share with you uh, about a project that my company did uh, for a bank here in Southeast Asia uh, as kind of a case studies. So in late 2017, a large tier one bank uh, in Southeast Asia came to us uh, and asked for help basically with an open banking and digital transformation uh, project. Uh, they wanted to be the first in their market that had actual open account uh, APIs uh, and in order to basically embed that data and make it available on third party applications so uh, and third third party platforms so think of you know checking out in a Lazada or online or something like that uh, that's essentially kind of what they were looking to do and facilitate. Of course, uh, because they were such a large organization, uh, they kind of had some very unique institutional enterprise hurdles, um, such as you know legacy generational you know monolithic architecture built around their core banking system, and there weren't off-the-shelf solutions that they could basically do uh, or they could go out and purchase to just enable uh, an open API to uh, for that. So the other kind of ish thing was is that. You know, any kind of delay in project completion kind of essentially risk cancellation of the entire project. Uh, if you haven't been in the enterprise uh, world for uh, too long, you, you probably are, or if you have been, then you probably are familiar with the idea that, you know, if, <laughs> uh, you know, the management, cir you know, circulates in and out, and when new management comes in, they cancel all existing projects that aren't finished, essentially. Uh, and on top of that, you know, they wanted to roll out uh, an open banking uh, API that, you know, but they had limited staff expertise in budget uh, in order to get that done. Um, so the bank that we worked with, uh, they had a mismatch of generational technology. And I'm, I'm just presenting this to, so you can kind of wrap your head around the complexity of the technology problem that uh, existed, which is, they had two core banking backends uh, built on top of an Oracle database and an AS400 uh, nightmare, uh, for lack of a better word. And the vast majority of the logic existed essentially in a uh, Java tier uh, that was kind of you know partial between Java logic and, and stored procedure logic uh, on the uh, respective databases. Uh, they had a very, very non-homogeneous backend systems. Um, that had SOAP and ISO 8583, uh, and they had uh, what I like to call non-idiomatic REST, uh, which is they had API services on the in internal backend API services that claimed to be REST, but were not actually REST. Um, and they kind of had some hurdles with that, is that because you know it had been generational, there was multiple different programming languages involved, you know, PHP, Python, Java, uh, Etc. Kind of all running on the on their back end, um, and a, a big challenge with this is that due to the uh, generational legacy uh, nature of this uh, and investment that they had in their existing system, uh, is that if we came in and tried to you know rip all of this out and you know start over from scratch, 
literally thousands of branches would, would you know, would essentially require uh, retooling, uh, as well as retraining of the, the staff. And that just wasn't realistic based on the project guidelines and, and, time, and time that we had. Um, so what we did is we basically came in and uh, we started with this, which was their kind of initial architecture. So uh, this was, j just to give you kind of an overview, oh, you can't really see the colors very well, but there's actually, uh, these here are actually like a grayish background, I guess. Uh, but basically they had these, uh, you know, a couple of different backend services that essentially exposed uh, their core banking systems to the ATM and the branch uh, applications, uh, as well as they had some uh, new generation uh, front end facing apps that were uh, again on these non idiomatic REST stuff. And that was basically going into this uh, monolithic J uh, Java application that you know provided this, the kind of standard facilities of the bank, you know, accounts, statements. Uh, and then they had a separate, uh, a completely separate system that ran on the back end that was, uh, you know, did reports and business intelligence, things of that nature. So very, very conventional, very typical enterprise kind of style uh, architecture and hierarchy uh, for their system components. Um, so the bank wanted to transform its internal processes. They wanted to essentially enable this new modern Silicon Valley-esque uh, development methodology and, and, and uh, process, which is essentially to you know, increase the delivery speed from concept to product. They wanted their developer teams to actually be able to you know, allocate computing resources internally, uh, and they wanted to expose their internal systems to new teams so that new products, new services could be pioneered in API, in, you know, in API format uh, and allow these, you know, kind of separate uh, autonomous teams to go out and, and deliver these uh, services. Um, and kind of one of the other big issues that they had is that with their monolithic architecture uh, of this Java application, if you have any familiarity with, with Java, uh, you understand then that there is kind of a realistic limit uh, of how big these applications can actually scale to kind of due to the limitations of uh, the architecture, kind of due to the limitations of, of the programming language involved. Uh, and basically, you know, they would continue every couple years, they would have to throw more and more larger, uh, you know, backend servers uh, to run this monolithic application. And they were kind of, you know, getting diminishing returns on, you know, how, how far out that could actually scale. Um, so what we kind of did is we came in and we worked with the bank to, you know, first set down the kind of processes and then, you know, work backwards from their goals to, you know, lay out the actual, uh, you know, end state of, of what they'd like to do. And in part of that, we, you know, came in and worked with the bank to, to implement a real agile, real scrum methodology. Um, and, uh, you know, then basically helped to work hand in hand with their developer teams to uh, migrate their monolith from the, you know, monolithic, sorry, to migrate their Java monolith to, you know, standardized microservices, right? Uh, of course, the bank, you know, caveated this where, look, we cannot have downtime. It's not possible, it's not feasible to have downtime. And going with this, uh, you know, they wanted to essentially, you know, simplify and better their processes internally where their developers could actually push code to production without all of the kind of the red tape and, uh, you know, kind of enterprise, you know, box checking that had existed previously uh, in order to, you know, so that their teams could actually move faster. Um, and part of that was is that in order to ensure low cost, they wanted to adopt open source, right? So uh, basically what we came in then is, is we, you know, 
sat down with them to kind of choose and pick their processes from a high level of, of how they're going to actually accomplish this, coming from a perspective of this is what's being done in Silicon Valley, this is, this is how this can actually be applied at your organization and you know, how it makes sense. And basically it kind of comes down to a couple things, is that adapt agile properly. Um, there's some caveats to that on about what is actual you know, agile and how do you actually ensure your, the adhesion to that process, but uh, getting that in place was kind of the most important to their internal process transformation. Uh, but then what we also did with their developers is that we immediately put in test-driven development, meaning that we stood up uh, architecture tests, we, we stood up code tests to actually test the code uh, and verify that it actually works prior to the code actually being pushed out. Once we were able to basically put in test-driven development as, a process, as part of their process, uh, it really rapidly allowed them to move significantly faster than they were before because developers could be confident that they could push code out to production uh, without it bringing down the entire system, right? And we were also were able to essentially do things like regression tests and other things of that nature. And in an automated fashion, we could verify that, uh, you know, the changes that we were making to this in this architecture migration were actually working and not causing problems on their uh, core banking or in or another location. Um, the other thing that we decided to do is we brought in GitLab uh, for the source control and the CI CD uh, pipeline management just because it was essentially free and open source and not necessarily because it's the best solution for the job. And one of these kinds of things that we see at organizations, uh, especially enterprise, uh, is everyone seems to think that there's a magic bullet in technology. And really it's, it's not so much about which technology choices you make. It's not necessarily about your programming language. It's not necessarily about your CI CD solution or you know, what your source control management is. It's really just more about your process and less about the specific technology. Uh, but that said, we chose GitLab primarily because it was free and uh, you know, basically because their developers were comfortable with, with using it. And kind of the other thing uh, that we did as well on, on part of their agile adoption was that we first standardized their de uh, deployment environments. If you're not familiar with this from a, a technical standpoint, there's the four standard technical, uh, sorry, the four standard deployment environments, which is development, testing, staging, and production. And we set this up in a way that their actual Git branching strategy uh, on their source code management matched the actual uh, deployment environments, right? This is kind of an important part of the process where all of your organizational side, whether it's from source code or whether it's from organizing your documentation, kind of needs to reflect the actual end product of how those APIs are being delivered to the uh, end user. Okay, so after we, were, after we were first able to get that process in place, right, uh, and we were able to get buy-in from all units of the organization, from all units of the enterprise, then it basically kind of came down to uh, how does one actually now go about getting these new microservices out to the end user? Uh, and part of that was uh, in the bank's journey is that they had a lot of investment in uh, old cloud and clustering solutions, and because they are a bank, they're not really capable of using a public cloud, right? So they had essentially three generations of server technology that they wanted to, to use in this new microservices architecture um, that we were building for them, uh, which is specifically, you know, OpenStack. They had bare metal, vanilla, you know, Dell and HP servers, and then they had a, a, a very, very large and significant investment in an ESXi cluster. Um, but with that, they wanted to somehow unify all of these systems into a single, you know, compute environment. Uh, and in order to basically, you know, add and remove nodes quickly, and as well as to accommodate for upcoming uh, de uh, depreciation cycles uh, that they had in their, you know, kind of standard IT roadmap. Um, 
they also had planned you know, on something like 36 to 48 months that they would start moving over to a public cloud and completely deprecate all of their on-premise hardware uh, at some point in the future. Whether or not that actually happens is irrelevant, but it's something that they were planning for. So the kind of question comes in is, well, what, how does one actually enable this in the modern age? And there is a very simple answer to that now, uh, luckily. And this is a very new uh, piece of software that's only been out for the last three and a half, four years, which is Kubernetes. It's a open sourced uh, orchestration solution from Google. And it's uh, essentially an open, a rewrite of Google's internal Borg system. Uh, but what it really does is enables future migration to other clouds because what it does is your deployment target now is not the cloud, it is instead Kubernetes. And it's compartmentalized in a way that however you run or your applications, so long as you can get it to run on Kubernetes, you can basically get it to run anywhere in the future, right? Whether that's AWS or Azure or, or whatever the case may be as well as being able to run it on your own uh, cloud infrastructure, your own hardware on premise, if, if that's the, what the case may be. Um, what's also really nice about Kubernetes is that it's a, a very powerful tool uh, and has very powerful, easy semantics for developers. And it, it really allows you to become a DevOps operation or DevOps shop, as opposed to, you know, kind of the previous you know, last 30 years of uh, operations is that, you know, developers and operations have been completely separate. So if there's talk in your organization about, you know, code as a, code as a, a service or infrastructure as a service, uh, whatever the case may be, Kubernetes really is the way that modern shops are delivering this. And uh, it's really kind of the key now to being able to deliver open APIs at a large scale. And I'll, I'll get a little bit more into that uh, about why that is later. Um, so part of the bank's journey is that uh, if you go back or if you uh, think about their uh, architecture is, you know, they had all of these generational systems and unfortunately they were all talking directly to these databases uh, or, you know, their core banking backend. Now obviously it's not possible in, when you talk about open APIs to expose the databases directly to consumers. Um, and it's very difficult to kind of basically get all of these services to talk to each other through non-standardized uh, systems. So uh, basically what uh, the bank chose to do is they chose to basically adopt a couple of standards, right? So they've adopted an API gateway to essentially expose and collect these services in a standardized fashion. Uh, and then they've basically adopted gRPC uh, as the RPC mechanism of, of choice. Uh, if you're not familiar with gRPC, uh, gRPC is basically the way that you, do, you are able to define service contracts and it allows very, very easy ways to expose that either through REST or hypothetically through SOAP or other mechanisms. Uh, but it also really makes it very simple to export your API definitions to your API gateway or your developer portal or your other kind of, you know, front end management products. Uh, the other thing is, is that it basically eliminates the necessity of writing any kind of SDK. Uh, you just write your, sorry, you write your service definitions in gRPC and it essentially handles all of that, um, all of the generation of your SDKs and stuff for you. You don't need anything else. Uh, so, uh, <clears throat> kind of the, the, the other primary thing here is, is that uh, in, in the bank, they wanted to emphasize new development over uh, maintenance of, of old systems. And they wanted to shift their internal teams, you know, into this standardized uh, development flow. And so kind of what they uh, needed to think about was 
if you're going to adopt Kubernetes or if you're going to adopt any kind of container orchestration or uh, deployment on the cloud in general, if you're talking about even deployment on you know, AWS or GCP, whatever the case may be, you need to start thinking about things like what is cloud native development uh, and what does that actually mean? Because there are certain programming languages that actually are fundamentally hard to deploy on the cloud. For example, Java. Uh, you know, it has significantly higher memory consumption requirements uh, that, might be, that might be available on your cloud. And these are the kind of the conversations that you need to have up front in your organization uh, before you actually start doing uh, certain solutions, right? Now, luckily in the case of the bank, because everything was more or less greenfield development, they didn't have any open APIs yet. Uh, we were able to essentially get them to agree and to standardize on the Go programming language, okay? Now, uh, <laughs> as, as, a, as a giant advocate for the Go programming language in general, I would, I would highly recommend that you take it back to your development teams uh, and basically push it as kind of the uh, next uh, thing to use. The reason for this is that it's really the only programming language that I know of that's truly cloud native in that it's very easy to build and maintain APIs written in it. It's directly designed to work with APIs like gRPC or a, I should say API frameworks like gRPC. Um, it produces a single static binary that is very fast and efficient and it has very low memory requirements. So, Kind of the, the typical thing that we see today on when you're deploying on a cloud, uh, whether that's a cloud that's masked by, by Kubernetes or it's masked or, or you're you know, deploying natively, is that the real limit is, is not processing speed. The real limit is basically memory. Um, and uh, <laughs> it, it costs a lot more to get gigabytes and gigabytes and gigabytes of RAM into a node than it does to stuff a bunch of uh, processor cores and to get them to, to network together. So please use Go if you're a developer. So <laughs> going back to this architecture uh, of the initial architecture that the bank was working with and uh, blowing, out, uh, blowing this out to the actual uh, real system, and I'm sorry, I'm on time here, uh, is that basically the bank needed to augment their existing systems and deprecate, uh, you know, over an extended period of time their existing components because they weren't able to, you know, destabilize their branch and their ATM network uh, in order to, to, in order to do that. So the way they did that is they basically, you know, decided to. Uh, explode the monolith into standardized microservices to gain the, scale, the scalability that they needed in, in the short term uh, because they were starting to get up onto real, real fundamental limits of how much RAM they could allocate on a node. Uh, their primary monolith system that they had only running one instance running of on their ESXi cluster uh, was already assigned 128 gigs of RAM and they were looking at a $200,000 investment for a single server that could actually have more RAM uh, for that. So part of their migration was that they really needed to uh, blow that out so that they could create you know, various levels of scalability, either you know, vertical or horizontal scalability. When we talk about vertical scalability, we're talking about basically deepening the stack of the microservices at each level, and horizontal basically just means you know, expanding the number of nodes, or i.e. the number of, uh, you know, actual instances of those APIs that are running. So this is the new architecture that they basically adopted, which is that they decided to eventually migrate their, uh, their old SOAP and 8583 into a standardized gateway that then was speaking uh, gRPC on the back end. And they decided to then introduce new APIs for identity and machine learning and stuff like that uh, as here on the, that, and then expose it through their uh, Apigee API gateway uh, on the front end. So at the end of the day, yeah, um, at the end of the day, this more or less is very similar to their architecture.
infrastructure. But keep in mind now, what's different is that because they're now microservices, they're no longer contained inside a single application. Uh, and now that now it's spread out across many different nodes and running m many, many different copies of the same piece of code, essentially. Uh, but otherwise, when you talk about this, this is really what it means to be a microservices, which is just basically exploding the monolith and, and breaking out the separate components into you know, separate little microservices that are running on, on your uh, back end. So long story short, uh, because the bank was able to do this uh, and because they put in the processes in place, they were able to do this in, in just over three months, uh, essentially. And now, because of that, uh, their systems are no longer bottlenecked by performance or scaling issues. They have greater density on their existing infrastructure, which means that their next refresh cycle is going to require significantly less investment in terms of new hardware and uh, new purchases. And their development teams now have confidence that they're able to rapidly deploy new products and serv services to end users. Uh, and they have an extensible platform by which it's very simple and easy for them to add new APIs and new services in the future uh, through that same architecture because it's now all been standardized. It's no longer different teams uh, that are doing things. Um, it, you know, essentially ad hoc style. Now it's prescribed. Um, so the other kind of thing is, is that we've uh, really, the bank was really able to very uh, simply allow their developers now to push to their staging and production environments literally with just a single git command line. And the senior management at the bank, who are not necessarily technical or developers, can also go in via their GitLab UI and can now roll back you know, deployments on their Kubernetes clusters in the same way. Um, so anyways, uh, conclusion essentially is you know, third parties, partners, and the banks, others, and IT, internal IT can now pilot and innovate new services leveraging the same set of APIs that are accessible across, you know, internal and external uh, parties. And that's it. So, uh, so if, you'd like to thank, uh, if you'd like to learn more, please visit us in the partners area uh, or uh, my personal and company emails are, are up there. So uh, thank you. So. Thank you. We have time for one question. Yeah. Hello. Hi. Thank you for, for your story. So, a uh, little question. Do you, the bank, operate one single uh, Kubernetes cluster for all the applications in production? Uh, so, you can. It just kind of depends. That, that just kind of comes down to a policy decision internally. So, Kubernetes has the ability to partition and segment. Uh, using namespaces, mm -hmm. so that you can have you can have the same hardware uh, appear to be multiple clusters, if if that's if that's your use case. Uh, so the question: If we have uh, multiple cluster for availability or something like that, mm -hmm. uh, that's not that possible for services just to deploy, so they can be visible from the other clusters. So, so, so again, it's just kind of a namespace issue. So if you want the two separate if you want to have the same physical hardware running uh, two separate partitioned clusters that don't know about each other, you can. But you can also enable the rules so that they can talk to each other. Enable the rules. Yeah. So okay. it, it's, yeah, it's just a configuration issue in, in your manifest files on Kubernetes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. One more question? Yeah. OK. One more. So security is like a big concern with banking, right? How do microservices, like what are the security things that you use, APIs, libraries, and mechanisms? Right. So, in, so we, we build all of the microservices that, that we build for banks or for insurance companies, uh, basically using Go. And we use JWT tokens to essentially enable uh, you know, access control uh, for that. So we spec out our endpoints using um, you know, essentially using scopes inside the JWT token, and that access control is, is, is handled through that. 
So in order to use, so the other thing is, is that with the, um, sorry, to, to go back to this, the, the new architecture here. Um, so the, basically each one of the endpoints, whether that's an identity or accounts or statements, uh, you know, essentially has a, a different scope. And there are, you know, these scopes are organized in a tree. And so the business logic basically, you know, knows that and understands that. And so that's what we're doing. And we generate, so we have a, a OAuth, uh, we have an auth server implementation that generates those tokens based on the scopes that the user uh, provides, uh, if that makes sense. Now that auth server on its own then integra integrates with the identity backends of the various banks that, that we work with. So. Yeah, thank you, Kenneth. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah thank you. Can applause him, yeah, thank you.